Well, today is Sunday, January the 3rd, 2021. Who would have thunk it, right? Who would have thunk? But we are in John chapter 18, as I said, verses 1 through 14. We're going to cover this morning. And our subject is something sensitive, something that people get really upset about. Our subject is betrayal. Certainly at the garden, certainly with Judas, but does betrayal get under your skin? Just read some of these Facebook rants and then turn it off real quick, right? But uh, Facebook is a horrible place to express your personal feelings because everybody knows it. Uh, not a good thing. Easy for people to say, hi, how are you? But in the head, eh, I'm not going to say nothing bad about you because I, you know, I, you know, not good. But betrayal is a tough thing. Uh, and we're going to talk about it today. There are two ways to respond to betrayal. One, I'll tell you right offhand, we're going to see Judas uh, betray Jesus at this time. And so we're going to see Peter handle it in the way most of us guys will handle things. He goes to his sheath, pulls out his sword, and takes a swipe. And if we, he would have been in basic training, Navy, Marines, or Army, he would have sliced the guy's head off. But he was a fisherman, so he kind of missed and took the guy's ear off. Now let me ask you a question. How many, guys, how many of you guys believe you're going to see Peter in heaven? But he blew it, guys. Committed murder in his heart. Are you going to still see him in heaven? Yeah, especially if you come from a Catholic background, right? You're going to say, oh, yeah, we're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we're going to see how Jesus handles things. Jesus knowing what was ahead of him, going through betrayal. The point is this. We don't know what 2021 is going to have. This next year is going to have for us. But you have better be ready how you will handle situations. Reading from the New King James Version Ushers, you're passing out Bibles right now. If anyone does not have a Bible, raise your hand. I want you to follow along. You should know your Bible. This is your book. Listen to me. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will remain forever. Forever. Maybe it'll be your Bible we'll be reading from upstairs. I don't know. But the point is that his word will last forever and ever and ever. That's why you need to be familiar with your Bible, where things are found at, the context that it's given. All right. Here we go, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, fulfilled, which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and brought him. And they led him to Annas' first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. And now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Church, you may be seated at this time. Let's just bow our heads and whisper up a prayer again. Father, we come to this time that we open up your word. And without you speaking to our hearts, without you, Holy Spirit, convicting us, opening up our minds and our hearts to it, Lord, it's empty for us. We might become people who know about you, have an intellectual understanding of who you are, but we don't have that relationship with you. We don't want to do that. We have a relationship with you, most of us do, and so we ask that you would speak to our heart through your spirit, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Church, I am sure 
that Jesus and his guys, his disciples, were feeling a little bit anxious when they're watching this crowd approach him with torches, lanterns, and weapons. How would you respond, right? Most of us guys automatically, we go on uh, defense mode, attack mode, or whatever. This is something very human that is in us. And we are flesh, and the Lord knows that we are flesh, and therefore he speaks to our hearts so that we might not only have it here in our hearts, but that we, our minds and our hearts can meet and respond in a way that Jesus has. Again, uh, just giving it to you quickly, two ways to respond to future events here on the earth that are unpredictable for us as the year begins to unravel here. There's going to be two ways you're going to respond. You're going to either A, respond and unload from your Glock 5 in the chest to whoever's approaching you, or you're going to say, Lord, you prepared me for this moment. Help me respond in the way that you want me to. And it could be poof, now you are an Oscar Mayer wiener. You know, God does miracles. But it could also be that you put the weapon, your sword, in the sheath. You know, the Lord knows what's going to happen. There's two ways to respond. Which way will you respond? Again, I'm sure the guys were feeling a little anxious to what lied ahead for them. Now, Jesus knew fully what lied ahead for him. He knew that in this present perspective, it wasn't good. Or from a present perspective, it wasn't good. They're going to arrest me. They're going to beat me. They're going to yank my beard off. They're going to punch me out. They're going to have me carry the cross until I can take it no more. And then they're going to nail me upon the cross. Jesus knew what he was going to go through, right? But from a future perspective, he would have paid for our sins. We would be in heaven because of his sacrifice for us. So he knew. The disciples just were not sure how personally this would all affect them. Yes, Jesus had prayed for them aloud to the Father. Yes, Jesus had committed them into the Father's hands. They knew that up here. They wanted to even believe it more down here in their hearts, but they were human beings just like you and I are, and sometimes it's hard to uh, wrestle with these things, and sometimes, though we'd like to say we can control the outcome, sometimes we just can't. We lose it because we're human beings. Now today... Some of us are perhaps a little anxious as to what does this next week, does this next month, does this next year, year have in store for us? Uh, what's going to happen to us? So we have a little bit of anxiousness going on as well. Now, the Bible says be anxious for nothing. And we know that. We receive that word, and we try to keep ourselves calm. But sometimes we are anxious for something, right? We ask the Lord to watch over us and we too should experience his peace as he prayed for the guys, right? He said in his teaching to them, listen, guys, guys, my peace I give unto you. What kind of peace did he have? Even while he's going to be arrested, Jesus is walking through it, as we would say, calm, cool, and collective, right? My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, you know, but as I give to you. My peace I give unto you. So today, you and I are benefactors. And if you have Jesus already in your heart, we know we have that peace that passes all understanding. Now, before us, we have experiences that Jesus and his team faced. And again, two ways of handling such experiences. When it's all said and done, when it is all said and done, I mean, you and I have been found handling terrible experiences in the same way that Jesus did. You have your Bibles. Let's look to them now. Verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kindron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Church, these words that our author, uh, the Apostle John, refers to, it says when Jesus had spoken these words, are the same words that began back at the end of chapter 14, verse 31. Jesus said to his now 11 disciples, remember they have finished the Last Supper, arise and let us go from here. And I shared with you, that's kind of like you and I. Hey, church is over, we'll see you guys next week. How many of you guys dart out to the car like right now? Most of us say hi. Most of us drink water. Some of us pick up kids. You just don't leave that fast. And so, of course, they had just again finished the Last Supper. But Judas had already left the upper room 
to go and betray Jesus. And Jesus has been tenderly and lovingly teaching the 11 who were with him after supper that stayed with him, you know, as they now have left the upper room with him. We find Jesus crossing this brook Kidron, right? And something about this brook Kidron. Uh, here is a little map of it. It will show you it is just right outside the river, the little brook, outside of Jerusalem, the city proper, right next to the temple. Uh, this garden that we're going to be talking about is the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's also right there. Uh, the Mount of Olives is right there. When we go to, and by the way, this whole valley, it's called the Kidron Valley. When we go to Israel, we always make it a point to be by this brook, to talk about this brook. We open our Bibles from this brook. Now, if you are a Bible student, if you are familiar with the Scripture, you know that King David left, and we'll go to this side now, left Jerusalem way back in the day, crossed the brook Kidron, and took off because his son Absalom was in rebellion, and he wanted to kill his dad. So David took the, the maids, the, the, took, not the maids, but the servants, some of his servants and people, and they went out uh, and went across this brook Kidron. So it's a great place as a Bible student to know. If you haven't seen it in Jerusalem, then uh, if we come back, when we come back with the Lord, you'll see it then. If there's no more trips to Jerusalem, as you know, the uh, borders to Israel, Mexico and Canada are still closed. And so we're not taking that trip this year as we thought we would have. Uh, but the story or the account of King David and his team leaving uh, is in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 23 and forward. Again, the garden that the author is going to be talking about uh, that he mentions is the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's the garden that's right there pointed out. All right, look at your Bible again. Verse 2, right? And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew this place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Church, this garden would later become an even more uh, special place as memories of the, uh, for, for memories of the disciples, if you may, right? John mentions it with both good and with bad memories, and sometimes that's just the way it is. The bad was, let me share that first, right? The bad was that Judas knew that Jesus and the rest of the guys or the disciples, they hung out there together. So, yes, it hurt because it was personal uh, that Judas used this place, a place they all hung out to be together before, uh, to betray Jesus. But he also betrayed them. Man, you had to take him to our place, our special place? Yeah, that's what happened. Again, the Garden of Gethsemane was and had been a haven of rest for the guys. Every time they come down from Galilee, they're getting ready to enter the city, to get into the big city. So kind of like you and I, we gas up our cars if we're going west before Las Vegas. You don't want to fill up in Las Vegas. You gas up before and you get through, right? Uh, just like they were coming into the city, they would rest at this Garden of Gethsemane. So it was a good place. The good memories were, as I said, that, that of hanging out with Jesus, just talking with him. Laughing with him, praying with him, little R and R at the garden, if you may. Uh, it was a good place, a good resting after the place after they had traveled by foot for days sometimes to get there. So, yes, in their future they would look back and hold this garden, garden as a very special place in their minds. Let me just ask you guys: Do you have a special place where you talk with the Lord and uh, pray, perhaps? Uh, a place that um, maybe uh, you have both good and perhaps bad or maybe just even sad memories? Do you have such a place? Well, let me share with you. I do. In the last two years or so, I have visited both the Evergreen Cemetery and the Rose Hill Cemetery where both sets of my grandparents and parents uh, were buried in Southern California. And to me, it is interesting um, how gardens and cemeteries, if you may, they are peaceful. They're peaceful. So prayerfully, one has more pleasant memories than bad ones or sad ones. I see people here walking in the cemetery, and they're not jogging through. I see them walking sometimes, pensive. I see them around gravestones, bringing flowers or doing what they do. But it's a place where people go. It's, it's quiet. Uh, I thank God. Because while I am walking through, while I was walking through the cemeteries, I thank him for the promises that I had made to my parents and I was able to keep. I am grateful for those. And then again, I'm sad 
For when I think of how much more I could have done for my parents, I shared with you before, I haven't always been uh, Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, and I still am not. Uh, there was a time in my life when my father was in prison, my mom was watching TV, she wasn't watching what we wanted to watch, she was watching these Count Yorga vampire type things in English and Spanish novelas and, Sp and, you know, and whatnot. Uh, and so I remember Take, I was so angry one time, I went to her TV and I took the rabbit ears at those times and I broke the antennas and threw them. And all I could see is just, ugh, you know, and my brothers and sisters, ugh, and I was in a rampage. I didn't think about how sorry I would be about these things until later on in the military. I'm gone, and I'm overseas, 18 months away from the house, that I started thinking about this. Man, that wasn't right. It just wasn't right. And even then, Lord, if you ever give me an opportunity to make it up to my parents, I want to. And so in my walks, as I visit the graves uh, of my parents, I stop by and I, I thank the Lord that he allowed me to make it up to moms, that I was able to make it up to my family. But then again, as I said, sometimes I think, oh, my gosh, and I get sad about this. There was so much more I could have done, just so much. So this garden it's a special place. It conjured up things later on for the guys, but this event took place in this garden, right? Um, may I encourage you, before we go on, may I just encourage you, as nothing brings more to mind uh, the uh, inevitableness or the quickness that you and I, as we walk through cemeteries or gardens, we may not be among the living, you know, uh, in the next few years, the next few months, sometimes accidents happen, you know. And so may I encourage you to take a walk and have a little talk with Jesus. And, and here's why I say this. Are there things that you have promised the Lord and you have not, as of yet, fulfilled them? Are there things that you have talked to the Lord about? Are there things, as you look around, uh, that you want to do, but you just need his help to get them done? So is a, a cemetery or a garden is a great place where you're not disturbed. Of course, you're not hearing voices come up, right? You're in the wrong place if so that happened. But uh, at least you could give your heart and your mind uh, to do these things, uh, accomplish these things. But you still have time. It's just good to do this. Coming back to verse 3. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came with lanterns, torches, and it says here, weapons and weapons. Church, you would say since leaving the upper room, when Jesus says, what you do, do quickly, and he was gone. Since leaving the upper room, uh, remember it was Jesus that had said this to him. Uh, Judas has been quite a busy fellow, right? We see what he's been up to in these last few hours that Jesus has been teaching the guys, sharing with the guys. We certainly see what Judas has been up to. One can say, man, oh man, Judas this guy was influential. And you think about this. Really, was he that influential? He was just a regular guy like the guys. But he was, from the eyes of the world, very influential. I can't go down the street and come back with a detachment of troops. I can't do that. This guy could, right? He was, as you would say, successful in his worldly uh, uh, interchange at this time. He was busy as a bee in getting things done. And church, yes, he was, but... Who was behind him in, this, in these evil deeds? Who gave him that success, right? Was it not the devil? You think you can make deals with the devil? There's many a rock and roll star that has confessed to his friends that they have sold their souls to the devil. That's just not a rumor or a myth. It's, it's happened from those guys from direct sources. It was the devil, Right? who in the temptations of Jesus offered to Jesus and showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Just not, there's the stuff, but here's everything that goes with it. Respect and the guys and hey bud and everything, the glory that goes with him. And in Matthew chapter 4 verse 9, said to Jesus, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Well, we know that Jesus did not. Judas perhaps did, because he was already, the devil had already entered him. Church, just as a quickie, as advice to you, don't make a deal with the devil. Don't do it, man, right? Don't seek out influence and this world's treasures 
at the expense of your soul. You don't want to go there, right? Jesus asked the question back in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What's it going to profit you? Nothing, right? Church, being a big shot in this world without Jesus is only temporal. It's only for a short time. But it has everlasting negative consequences. In contrast, being a little shot in this world, if you may, right, with Jesus might be challenging for sure. But the benefits, as we say, they are out of this world. They are just tremendously out of this world. You're looking forward to that. Back to the scripture. So Judas came to the garden as a big shot, right? In verse 4, it says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? Let's just pause here for a second. Observe with me that back then, for sure, right, Jesus knew what was coming, and he didn't run. He didn't run. Second part of verse 4 says, he went forward. Now, just as a, this is your Bible, perhaps you should write that down because we want to be like Jesus. You know, we are to go forward. No matter what's going to come down our way, we are to go forward in the things of God. Listen, church, in general, in general, without knowing the exact step-by-step -step plan that the enemy, the devil, has for us in the future, in the near future, right? We know, as Jesus knew what is coming, we know that there is a one-world government being formed. We know that inflation is going to get so bad that a bag of gold cannot buy a piece of bread. We know that the mark for you to be a player, you got to take the mark or you can't buy, sell, trade, or, or this and that. We know, so we know in general what's coming down. Might not know the play-by-play, the -play, but we know what in general is coming down, right? The question is, will you go forward in the things that pertain to God? If you do not settle your mind and your heart, if they're not connected now, you won't be ready when this time comes. Think about it. They're in the garden. They're praying, right? And torches, they're seeing lights come up. They're hearing troops come. Troops are not quiet people. Sometimes they're very noisy. You need a hit squad to be quiet. But these are troops that are coming, and they have weapons with them. The guys are like any other guys. It's like, like you know, your adrenaline's going up. Do I fight, fly? What am I going to do? I was mentioning to first service that uh, years ago, and I counted them, it's like 47 years ago, right? Maybe longer, 48 years ago. I was in an exercise in the military called uh, Escape and Evasion, and they separated us in teams of three, about 50 yards apart, in the middle, uh, well, without a full moon, in Fort Knox, Kentucky. It was dark, trust me. It was dark. A few hours before, they had said to us, you never want to be taken as a POW. No matter what happens, you never want to be taken captive by the enemy they would do bad things and in that they said such as these aggressors right and all of a sudden there was like this big old banner and these guys broke through the banner and what they were they were uh rangers from fort benning georgia that had come over and they were doing their exercise and part of their exercise was taking the enemy and i'm standing at ease in line information with 350 other guys and they dragged the guy next to me. The guy just reached out his hand, big old muscle arm, pulled the guy out, and there goes the guy flying by me. And they're telling us, you never want to be taken by these guys. You know, they will not have mercy on you. So here comes the evening. Three men teams. One gets a rifle, moi. One gets a, a, a um, uh, forget what you call those things, uh, to drink water, thermos or something like that. A canteen. It's called a canteen at that time. And then one gets a compass. And the goal was we would hear a bomb. And sure enough, as we're separated, we're our team, you hear, that was our goal. We crossed the road. Our target, five miles into the wilderness, there will be an ambulance with a little light going around. That's your target. Every half hour or so, they would shoot up a flare so you knew your direction in case you were going to get lost. When that thing started, we're in about 100 yards, and we hear machine gun fire. Da -da 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 -da. Unbeknownst to us, they had speakers up there. And then they had voices. And that's how we knew we were speakers. They were Japanese voices saying, Americans, surrender. You have no chance. If you surrender, we will give you cigarettes and all this stuff and whatnot. 
And we know you don't want to get caught by the aggressors. They were going to, these guys that we saw a few hours ago, they're the aggressors. And sure enough, we're in another maybe 200 yards or so, and I hear the voice, hey, you guys, get over here. We got you. We got you. And our team panicked, and before we knew it, we were surrounded by five or six of these guys. And they took the compass away from the one guy. They told the other, give us your canteen, and I'm holding the rifle. And what's the first basic thing they teach you in, in the military? You never lose your weapon. You never give away your weapon. They take your gun, you're dead with your own gun. You never let it go. So these thoughts are going up and down to me, and they're yelling at me, and I go complete barrio kid from East L.A. I freaked out. I slammed the guy with the rifle. I threw it at the other guy, made myself a clearing, and I'm running for my life. And I could hear these guys coming. Now, there was a little distance, and I had had an experience. We won't go into that. Back in the eighth grade, running from the cops, jumping in a bush, they went by me. So I'm, I'm, I'm running and realizing I'm go going through branches. My face is probably being cut up. I didn't care at the time. We had prepared. We had taped up our dog tags. We had colored ourselves with our black polish and stuff so that in case any light hit you, you wouldn't reflect. And I got a little daylight, and I hit the ground. I'm in this bush, and my hands are under me, under my chest. I'm laying with my face down, and I could hear, <laughs> where did this guy go? Branches breaking. Where did he go? Right? And I'm, all of a sudden, you become a real Christian. Oh, Jesus, forgive me for all my sins. <laughs> you know, uh, those antennas I broke for mom. <laughs> you know, and so all these thoughts go through you as you're right there sitting still, knowing that they're going to hear your heart pounding, pow, pow, right? But they didn't get me. They went to the left. They went to the right. Flare went up. I saw the direction it was in. And I start working my way towards that. Never in the light. You wait till the flare goes out. You got an idea of where you're going. You're not going to talk to anyone. You don't, no one's your friend. You got to get to the other side. And sure enough, I thank the Lord in his mercy. I was like number, it was 355. I was like number 55 that came in that night. The next morning, they were still looking for people. Some of those guys in my team had gone to POW camp, and that wasn't fun. They'd strip you down to your, your shorts, right? And uh, they'd put you in a, a barrel. They'd put, like, molasses on you, close the, the lid on you, had a little light, and all these bugs are climbing up towards the light, and you're in there, name, rank, serial number, you know, all this stuff that's going through you. All kinds of goofy stuff they were doing to the guys that they caught. Uh, but I didn't get caught. But I say that to bring you to what's going on here. The guys that were Jesus and this military little detachment is coming towards these 12 guys. I have not been trained in military tactical maneuvers or anything like that, but here they are. It is a real thing. Fast forward. I don't know what tomorrow has. I don't know if our world's going to go crazy. I don't know this and that. I know this. I am anchored in Jesus Christ. Are you? You know, I want to respond in the way Jesus has responded, knowing that no matter what happens to me here on earth, I'm going to be in heaven. Do you have that security? We need to know where we stand, and we certainly need to be prepared before something like this happens. So Judas comes to the garden as a big shot, as I said, and, and Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, verse 4, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking, right? And uh, again, observe with me that back then Jesus knew what he was going to go through, and he went forward. Now listen, in general, we said, we know what's going to happen, right? Uh, but the point is, are you going to go forward with the things that pertain to God or not? Number one, will you witness for Jesus this new year or not? Because it's different. Hmm, right? Will you say you're a follower of Christ or not? That's why I say Jesus went forward. You ought to underline that. Put a little side note to yourself. Yes, Lord, help me to go forward or something like that. Because if you're not thinking about it, what are you going to do? Lastly, will your actions speak louder than your words or not? Church, we have work to do for the kingdom of God. And it is best to move forward in our minds so that really we will do these things for the Lord. Or else we won't be doing them. Thus Jesus asked again, last part of verse 4, whom are you seeking? And they answered him, verse 5, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Why would that happen? There are many people that would write notes and 
have some thoughts. But remember, Jews have been raised, and one of the first things that happened for the Jewish history before they became a nation, right, was that the Lord appeared to Moses in a burning bush. And when Moses is having this little dialogue with Jesus, he said, well, by bottom line, who shall I say that I am? And he said uh, to Jesus in his uh, uh, appearance there, he says, uh, say that I am has sent you. So the I am has always been in the Jewish mind. Perhaps when he said, I am he, these guys being Jews, though non-believers in Jesus at that time, maybe that's what made them fall back. Maybe that's what it was. It probably was, we don't know. But, you know, the question is still, why did they fall backwards? Well, could it have been also, or maybe, let me just throw this at you so I give you something else to think about, that Jesus did not have this little halo flowing over his head? Hi, I am Jesus. Can't you tell by the painter's rendition that I'm holy? Right? Well, that wouldn't be it. Could it have been that they were expecting some Hercules type of a rough neck, of a hoodlum, right? That even justified them bringing their weapons. What had they been told by the religious leaders? Why were they coming after him, so aggressive, coming after one man? Church, if you don't know this, just in general, if your vision of Jesus is a blonde hair, blue-eyed, nice-looking man that you might have a picture of, you know, sad to say, you got it wrong. You just got it wrong. How do we know this? Because the word that is very little in describing what Jesus looked like was given about 800 years prior by the prophet Isaiah. Okay? The prophet Isaiah, in his book, chapter 53, verse 2, second part of it, he prophesied of him and he said, quote, he has no form of comeliness. In other words, when you see someone that's attractive or someone you can talk to, you know, whatever, uh, it, you know, that stands out in the crowd, that's not what Jesus would look like, right? And it says, he goes on, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Hmm, right? We, if you read your Google and stuff like that, what was the average Jewish man's height at the time? How about this? Five foot five. Five foot five. Is Jesus five foot five? No, not in my book. He's like six foot, broad shoulders, blonde hair, blue eyes. Or you're from East L.A., brown hair, you know, brown eyes. If you're from Africa, he has a fro, man, a real fro. woo You know, we have all these thoughts. But we have to go with the Bible. Right? We have to go to the Bible. I remember the, in, the, in the time when the guys wore the long hair and the church was, I belonged to a crazy Pentecostal church. Dude, cut your hair. Hey, man, Jesus had long hair. Oh, how do you know? You got this big picture right there. Board, deacons, they couldn't say anything. It was the truth. Right? So there it is, you know. Listen, if the world today saw Jesus outside of his glory, right, if they just saw him as a man, I guarantee you they would not put him in People magazine. You just wouldn't see him there. And I know, you ladies, People magazine has the 10 sexiest men in the world, you know, but we're not going to go there. But that's what this magazine prints, right? That wouldn't be Jesus. So why did they fall back? Why did they fall backwards? Again, the Bible doesn't say, but this is what they did. As they got up again, Jesus asked in verse 7, check it out, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Now he's brought them in again, focused on one name, one guy, right? Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Jesus is going to take one for the team. He's going to take one for the team right here. You need to see this. And here's a little insight that John, our author, gives us. Now remember, John's writing this 40 years later, right? Uh, he says, verse 9, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Jesus spoke, he had said this, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. If you were here with us at 17, Jesus was praying to the Father, and he let the guys in on his prayer, one of the few rare prayers, and Jesus is asking him, Father, you have given me these guys, you know, help me not to lose any of the guys, you know, I'm not going to lose any of the guys except the one from the son of perdition, that was Judas, but no one else am I going to lose, right? So this is what's coming out here. So two observations here. 
Number one, the first one is that Jesus answers this hostile crowd, uh, answering them that he and only he is the one that they came after. So you should be happy with just taking me. Here I am, right? Number one. The second observation, though, again, the Apostle John's insight for us, given by the Holy Spirit to him to write this verse, this is a verse, right, meant for us, for you and I, even today, to take comfort no matter what's coming down the street. And you look at it, huh? Yeah, no, it's meant for us to take comfort. Verse 9 is a verse for our security. It's for our security. What Jesus had prayed for to the Father regarding those whom the Father gave him, he would lose none. How many of you guys know that you are saved? Know that you have accepted Jesus. You believe in him. Father is not going to lose you. He is not going to lose you. This was true then, and wait for it, wait for it, it is true for us today. Let me share with you some scripture regarding assurance and security for the believer. Jesus said, quote, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day, John 6, 3, 9. You are a prize to Jesus. Jesus is coming to earth with a kingdom. Who's making up his kingdom? Moi. And you are. No. Us. And, and us. We're part of Jesus' kingdom. God's not going to let anything happen to us. Here's a little more. Talking about assurance and security for the believer. Jesus said, and remember what Pastor Mike said about communion, right? This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. John 6, 51. If you did not notice, Jesus, who gave his, who is the bread of life, and he gave his flesh. If you did not notice, little sidetrack. Did you notice the cross? Did you guys notice the cross? It is just begun. We got some plans for this cross, but I wanted to show you, you know, I wanted to show you. First, the painting of the walls, then the carpet up here. We have the carpet um, for the floor stacked away in the warehouse right here. But we have brought new chairs in. We're ready. Now we have the cross. Why? We want to be ready. We want to be ready for 2021. We don't want people to say, oh, Calvary Chapel, you're still the same old, same old. No, we want to grow. If you fix up your house, we should be fixing up the house of the Lord. That's just the way it is. And, that's, and we as a leadership uh, group are responsible for that, that we do these things. All right, back to what we're saying. All right. Jesus gave his life, his flesh, right? And he did it for the life of the world, which I shall give for the life of the world. When he said it in John, it hadn't happened. Here it is, ready to happen. Lastly, something about assurance. Well, not lastly yet, but assurance is security for the believer. Check this out from the Old Testament. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What does that mean to you? You know what it means to me? And those that can say this, like David, I'm not changing teams. I don't care where we're at in life, and I don't care what's coming against them. I am not changing teams. I belong to the Lord, and I shall not want. I'm not going to fill it in with another. I'm not going to let someone else say, but it's so nice over here, and you can have all these cush things. I am not changing teams. I belong to Jesus Christ now, and I shall not want. There is nothing else, nothing else that will satisfy the inner man Nothing else that will satisfy me in the future as to the team that I belong in. That's why I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That's why I will share it, and I don't care what anybody else thinks. I shall not want. I am assured in Jesus. And when the psalmist wrote this, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This is a great time. And we take, we take refuge in this. We take our, we, this is confidence for us. This is security for us. You need to know who you belong to. And if you belong to Jesus, it doesn't matter what's coming up ahead. We don't need anything else or anyone else. He takes care of us. us. Lastly, assurance, security for the believer. Listen to this. Assurance is the Christian's full conviction that through the work of Christ alone, received by faith, he or she is in possession of a salvation in which he or she will be eternally kept. Right? This assurance rests only upon the scripture promises to him and her who believes? Do you believe? Do you believe? 
You know, because it's all about where our heart is, where our mind is. Do we believe in him? Church, the second observation then is that Jesus doesn't want you to miss what he spoke to his father about. And thus he said, of those you have gave me, none have I lost. Oh, I have lost none. History reveals that Jesus did not lose any one of, any one of those 11 guys that remained, the remaining disciples. And wait for it. Wait for it, right? History will reveal in the future that he did not lose you. You are going to be with him for eternity. And you'll see what history right. He didn't lose me either, man. I was with him. I believe. And I came. Here I am in heaven because Jesus did not lose none of us. He's not going to lose us, right? Now, that being said, <laughs> there will always be someone among us, someone that we know who has confessed Christ, and we see his life, we see him living like the devil. And we say, that guy's confession couldn't have been real. That guy, when he said yes to Jesus at Sunday school, uh, that was the last time he said that. So he's probably not a Christian. Really? Really? I want to talk to you about someone that lived like that, someone that had an experience like that, and that is the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter. Again, raise your hand. Are you going to see Peter in heaven? <laughs> Something happened. Something had happened, right? But the devil and our own selves sometimes without the devil, we just do some dumb things, some really silly things that when people see us, we're at our worst. And while all we can say, hmm, I know, I know, I know, don't tell me anything. I know this flesh of mine. What a battle it is, right? Look at verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and he struck the high priest's servant, and he cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. And the reason they put this name down, he's not in the other Gospels, but there's always Christian Bible quizzes. Who was the servant that Peter cut the head, ear off, right? You should know and get an A on that point. It's Malchus. Right? Listen, again, had Peter had any military training, he wouldn't have missed. He wouldn't have taken off the ear. He would have taken off the guy's head. That's the kind of guy, that's how he's responding right now in the flesh. If you pull out your gun, if you pulled it out, you're going to use it. One of the biggest things that they teach you, if you have a gun, if you pull it out, you're going to use it. You're not threatening anybody. And the guy on the other side, he knows that 9 out of 10, the guy's not going to pull the trigger. Why did you pull it out? Why did you pull it out? Right? Peter pulled out his sword. Nothing stopping him. He's energy going. That arm is going back. It's not like a golf swing, guys, but it's going back, right? And he's coming across with all he had. And this guy, Malchus, is probably just going for his life. Everybody else's eyes are... What is going on? As they see this sword slice and a, a big moth, but it was an ear flies off. Blood everywhere, right? I mean, can you see what's going on? The adrenaline of everybody jumping. You know, what is going on, right? What does Jesus say? Listen, before we get to what Jesus says, if he had cut off his head, I believe in my heart Jesus would have just done another miracle, right? He'd been doing them. But now, I ask you, are we going to see Peter in heaven? Well, would you do the mature thing when you're in heaven and you run into Peter? Don't go up to him and say, dude, what were you thinking you took off the guy's ear? I'm telling you, everybody's going to ask him that. You know, everybody's already going to ask him, don't you be, be mature about him. Hey, dude. <laughs> yeah. You know, but don't, don't go in there and be like that. All right, back to the Bible, 11. Look at your Bible. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? It's a question. Come on, Pete, you know better. I have talked to you guys. I know what's going on, right? Again, church, Jesus knew the cup which Father God had given him. That is, he knew that he would give his life for the sins of the world. He knew it. 12. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. I think that this is what I know. A man gives up when he knows what's ahead. Most guys are going to fight the cop to the end. And that's why they get shot and killed him, whatever. But if you know, you know, Jesus knew this is what the Father has put on me. He mans up and they cuff him or they take him away. 
The guards are feeling good. We got our man. We got our man. So let, let's get out of here quickly before someone else is. Dude, is your ear attached? Yeah, he attached my ear. Jesus isn't saying nothing anymore. They're taking him. Right? Be careful in this future that's coming. You make sure you've prayed through and you're, you thought through. Now, let me change the situation around for you. Someone breaks into my house. I happen to walk in, and they have my beautiful Sunday school teacher, wonderful wife for all these years, Judy, by the neck, and the arms going up with a knife. Yeah, if I have a Glock with me or whatever, if I had a bazooka with me, you know, I'm going to use it. I'm not taking it out. Oh, this was a nice gift. I remember back in 68. No, it's just not going to be like that. It's going to be get up, you know, you're there, you point, you know, ta 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 You know, you're going to let him have it. I know that. That's a whole different situation. But as Christians going in and you're being mocked for your faith, and it's all about faith, and you know you tie it in with the Lord, you know, how are you going to respond? My encouragement, my exhortation to you, you want to be like Jesus. You don't want to be a Pete at this time and pull out the sword. Swords are for defense, and so are guns to protect. But if you're going on offense, you're going on offense without up here and up here, and it's not for the Lord, has nothing to do with the Lord, dude, do death. Pray about it. All right, moving on. Then the detachment of troops, we said, right? And the captain of the officers, verse 12, of the Jews arrested Jesus. They bound him, 13, and they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now, it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it was expedient, or your Bible might say advantageous, that one man should die for the people. Church, the world and the devil had their plan. Father God had his as well. In a few short hours as we're going through this, historically, Father's plan would be accomplished. But for you and I, to hear that plan, you have to join us next week while we continue with the rest of the Scripture. Before I leave you, before we pray and close, I want to say this to you. Peter, we are going to see him in heaven. And if you're a Sunday school kid, that you heard the truth when you were a little kid, and you confessed the things to the Lord, but you became a middle schooler, started hanging out with the wrong crowds, or for whatever reason, you went to the left when you should have gone right. And you know now the last 15, 20, perhaps 40 years, you felt like you weren't that Christian because you'd done some dumb things. I want to say this to you. Jesus does not make mistakes. When he spoke to you and you had that tender heart and you said yes to him, he wrote your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And nothing is going to take that away. He will lose none of you. Even if we do dumb things. But as the Spirit of God speaks to your heart and you know you got to get right with the Lord, get right with the Lord. Live out the rest of your time for him. And glory is yours. The glory of heaven will be yours. But I'm telling you, don't let Satan rip you off that, you, yes, you were that kid. And all he's hoping is that he keeps you down. Hoping that you never listen to the voice that says, I love you. You are still my kid. I went to Calvary's cross for you. I paid for you. You do not belong to the devil. You belong to me. Satan would just wish that you never wake up out of the stupor you have been in in all these years or all these months or whatever. Come back to the Lord. He loves you, and he'll give you another opportunity to serve him. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, because it does not go out in vain, Lord. But your word speaks to our heart, and it challenges us, Lord. And it, it is comforting for us, Lord. We, we gosh, Lord, we, we're just one with it, Lord. Thank you for it. And we ask you, Lord, if there is anyone here today, Lord, that has fallen away, that has been a Peter for so long, Lord, at this moment of his life, Lord, I pray that you have spoken to them as well. Bring the backslider back to you, Lord. And, Lord, if there's anyone here that has never surrendered their life to you, Lord, may today be the day that they give you their heart as well. And we ask these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand, church?